Hello everyone, this is Dino Chris from Prehistoric Facts. This is a special episode number 146. We're going to be talking about a prehistoric carnivorous mammal, and that carnivorous mammal is... Homotherium. So I'm sorry for this picture to be a little bit blurry, but this is a possibility of what Homotherium would actually possibly look like. Some information about Homotherium. Homotherium means same beast. Length 7 feet, 2 meters. Height 3.5 feet, approximately a meter. Weight 400 to 500 pounds. Lived 4 million to 12,000 years ago in the Pliocene and Pleistocene. Found in North America, South America, Eurasia, and Africa. And it was described by Owen in 1846. And I'm guessing this is going to be Sir Richard Owen. And so, yeah. So on the upper left corner, you can see is the global map, and you actually find, you see, Homotherium was actually found in North America, South America, Africa, and Eurasia. So it was found almost everywhere uh, around the world, and so that is a pretty significant. Of course, there's a couple of species of Homotherium, but of course I'm going to be a little bit more focused on the North American uh, version of Homotherium, which is this guy right here on this picture in the middle right and so you can see the height the, the, you see the home the two different species of homotherium they're actually going to be very very similar in height and they're and one's possibly going to look different from the other but it's pretty much they're going to be uh pretty much the same height and you can see they're half the size of a human being and uh, on the bottom left corner you actually see is a skeleton of homotherium and so this was based off of a specimen that is in the uh, university of texas as a museum so you can actually go check out that uh that homotherium and i'm pretty sure there's other homotherium uh in museums uh anywhere in north america europe and possibly south america too more information about homotherium homotherium belongs to the philididae so that's the cat family and it is nicknamed the scimitar tooth cat so as you can tell on um, the canines of Homotherium, they're shorter than Smilodons, and so this probably means is that they are probably going to have a little bit more of a powerful bite uh, than uh, Smilodon. But similar tooth cat, that's pretty much the nickname because their teeth look like the famous dagger, the scimitar. And of course, uh, other features of Homotherium, it's got long front limbs and short back limbs that is very common amongst the saber tooth cats in the scimitar tooth cats and this animal would actually be an ambush predator so it is not going to chase its prey down so when you actually see those long front legs you would think that this is an animal that can run really fast and go great distances but it's not this is an animal that would actually rather go short bursts of speed and actually just wrestle its prey to the ground because you see these animals would actually be using their front limbs to actually wrestle their prey to the ground and then use their teeth to aim for the to bite at the neck area to actually uh, attack blood, to actually um, kind of like uh, hit the throats or the blood vessels uh, in the neck. So it would actually let its prey bleed to death. And there is evidence that Homotherium would be a pack hunter. So because there is a fossil, there's a fossil site, a cave in Texas that was actually they had Homotherium specimens along with its prey in this cave. There's plenty of like juvenile cubs of homotherium and even adult specimens as well and so there is a behavior aspect too of that fossil site so uh, i'm not sure if this fossil site is open to the public but i'm pretty sure it is actually a i'm pretty sure that uh some scientists would actually tell you that um you probably can't go down there because it's very risky going down there but uh, you would possibly find some specimens that were found in that cave in Texas, uh, some museums and universities in Texas. The environment in Homotherium lived in, it was cool and dry, so it was not going to be very warm. It was actually going to be very cool. Uh, lush grasslands and, of course, a bunch of forests, because this was during, like, the beginnings and also near the end of the Ice Age is when Homotherium actually lived, and so you get the idea of why it would be cool and dry. And in southern southern parts of North America, it was actually very, uh, it was like say Texas, it was actually much cooler uh, than what it was to, than what it is today. 
because Texas could actually reach like 110 degrees uh, on a very bl a very hot day in the summer uh, today. But back then, it would have probably been like maybe close to like say the highest it can go would probably be like uh, 80, like probably 90 degrees. And so that is a much cooler uh, type of environment. And of course, there was pot, and of course there was plenty of animals there. There was a, like a bunch of insects, birds, reptiles, amphibians, and of course all the big uh, mammals that were around too. So a competition and prey. So the prey that Homo therium would actually be going after the prehistoric bison, the bison that is actually going to be a foot and two feet taller uh, than the bison that we see today. And of course, it would be going after juvenile mastodons and even juvenile Columbian mammoths. Now, these animals were actually going after the Columbian mammoths most of the time, not the woolies, because the woolies were further north and the Columbians were a little bit more further south. And so it would still take down mastodons, but uh, the cave that I was talking about actually have a bunch of bison and, co and juvenile uh, Colombian mammoths. So that was a pretty rich site uh, to actually to actually see that kind of behavior. And of course, there's competition for uh, Homotherium. Of course, Smilodon, which is the larger uh, version of the saber-toothed cats, and so it possibly could be in competition with Smilodon from time to time. But I think they're going to avoid each other majority of the time. Dire wolves. Dire wolves were very abundant at that time and i'm pretty sure homo therium could probably stood its could stand its ground against uh dire wolves of course short-faced bears now homo therium would not dare uh take on a short-faced bear especially an adult it would actually just leave the short-faced bears alone because first and foremost why would you want to get nailed by a bear that is 12 feet tall when it's standing up on its back legs and it's got paws the size of a catcher's mitt, and its bite force is about 2,000 pounds. You do not want to mess with that animal. And of course, American lions. American lions would be the larger uh, felines of that time, and so you would actually be uh, seeing uh, Homo therium probably avoiding the American lions as well. And of course, humans. Humans actually came around the southern portion of North America and South America, and so probably pretty much around North America, uh, they probably they were actually around uh, the southern parts of North America, probably between uh, 20,000 to 15,000 years ago, and so that's pretty much where you actually see a lot of the competition of Homo therium, seeing that Homo therium was actually starting to die off a little bit more. But I'll get into the extinction a little bit later. Next thing. So the extinction of, of Homo therium it was mostly going to be due to climate change, but it's a possibility that uh, overhunting of humans, because uh, uh, humans were going after the same things, the Colombian mammoths, the mastodons, the bison, uh, horses, camels, I mean, all sorts of stuff. But mostly it's going to be the climate change, warming climate. So the climate in where Homo therium would actually be living in, like in Eurasia and also North America, uh, the climate was actually getting warmer, and so the summers were actually starting to get much warmer, and the winters were actually going to be a tad bit warmer as well. And so that's why you actually see uh, some more abundant grasslands and semi-arid environments were actually starting to come about, and the giant mega and the big megafauna uh, were disappearing. So, like your mastodons, your mammoths, and all the horses, camels. And uh, big bison, of course, all disappeared. And of course, smaller predators were actually taking advantage of the niches that Homo therium actually uh, left behind. And so, like, you got, like, your uh, cougars mo or mountain lions and even uh, wolves, like gray wolves and even, of course, grizzly bears. And so that's why you actually see a lot of those smaller predators starting to become more abundant after uh, the end of the age of dinosaur, or the end of the age of the ice in the, the Ice Age, excuse me, but also when Homo therium was starting to die off. And so that's why you actually see uh, an abundance of those smaller predators. And so here's the Pleistocene around 50,000 years ago, but 12,000 years ago, it would have actually have seen a much more different uh, glaciation pattern. And so, so some of them regions of North America, South America, 
Africa and even Eurasia and those areas right there. That's where you actually will see the last remnants of Homo therium around 12,000 years ago. So the next episode would be in December 6, 2019, and there'll be a Q&A episode, so there will be no new episode next week. It would actually, because we all need our break for Thanksgiving, and so happy Thanksgiving to everybody, and hopefully you have a good time uh, spending time with your family and also enjoying some good food. But uh, of course, like I said, the next episode will be in two weeks, so... It will be a Q&A episode, so if you got any questions about dinosaurs or any other prehistoric life, feel free to email me at dinochris71 at gmail.com. Let's go to my Facebook page, Prehistoric Facts with Dino Chris. Like the page, you actually post your questions on the wall or in the comment section. And also for you YouTubers out there, feel free to like the videos, subscribe to the channel, because that helps out the channel a lot. And also leave your questions in the comment section, uh, because I read them all and I actually do uh, take them as as good questions to actually uh, show up on my on on each the, of the Q&A episodes. So, but remember, I can only read a certain amount of questions, so probably leave at least two to three questions. Uh, that way I can actually uh, know who, who's the ones that are actually doing that, and I can read them all that way. Don't actually send me like, like 10 questions at once, because I can't read them all, and so I would have to select a certain, a certain ones that I can answer. So just remind everybody, I just want to remind everybody about that. Just leave at least two to three questions a time so that way I can actually uh, read them all. And so so that way I can actually get all those questions in in one video in a Q&A episode. But anyway, but you get the idea for YouTubers and I'll actually pronounce your uh, YouTube names as best as I can because there's some tricky ones out there. And so and I'll uh, give you a, a pretty good shout out. And uh, also keep your questions short and to the point. You can also follow me on Twitter at C-S-G-R-A-L-L. It's my Twitter page. I post pretty cool stuff on there. And also take care of the people around you. Notice for you younger people out there to make sure you listen to your parents, your teachers, and your guardians. It's the best motivation you could have a good education. It's very important to have good education. So with a good education, you get a good job in the future. That's it for now. And I'll see you guys in two weeks.